148 megahertz. Well, just below that, in around 142, 143 megahertz, are the receive frequency for all the police agencies. Well, I, I guarantee you that you start interfering into that band, Alan or one of his associates will be coming to your door for a little chat. <laughs> so that's the main thing. It's, it's so you know what you're doing so that you're not causing any harmful interference to others. So that's why they're saying, why do you have to learn all this stuff? Just a, just a basic knowledge of what's going on with radios and antennas and stuff, just enough so that you can, you can operate, stay within the law, and maybe have some fun. And it, it was designed as an experimental mode so that you can experiment, learn things, try things. Anyway, so let's get started. It's based on the code. Alright, so for communications, what do we try to do when we're com for communications? We need to transmit or, or relay some piece of intelligence. Intelligence is a general term saying it could be a voice, could be uh, some characters, words, some music. Anyway, we need to transmit it from one place, receive it at another place. So, oh, back in the old days, this we had a near station. Hey, we moved on. We have a postal carrier. Something that carried a My piece name of is paper Jack Cooper. with our intelligence on it. And I'm no pilot. Point A to point B. And as we graduated, the right place. we started using the wrong time. way to do it over the wires. Sometimes you don't get to choose your path. Well, it chooses you. Of turning on and off with DC current, which picked up a little... Uh, called a sounder at the other end, and by a series of uh, pulses, short and long, by a predetermined sequence, we could send the, the whole alphabet, and therefore we could transmit our messages from point A to point B. Well, tonight we're going to talk about communicating using a carrier wave. And basically what it boils down is, how do we impress our intelligence onto a radio frequency carrier. Well, we use a high frequency carrier for a lot of things. Like first, <coughs> excuse me, first of all, our sound waves only travel as far as you can yell. And if we were to try and use too low a frequency, as you learned before, the wavelength of our antenna is based on the frequency. So if you use too low of a frequency, we're gonna have some ridiculous size of an antenna. So we use something in the radio frequency band. So, say, a pure radio frequency wave does not keep any. So if I'm just generating an oscillator, just a, just a high frequency a sine wave, there's, there's nothing in it. There's no information in that. So what we've got to do is we've got to change or modify that carrier in some way, but it, it can be detected at some distant point. So by changing the carrier, we call it modulation. And we can change three parameters of this signal. We can vary the amplitude or the, or the intensity of it. We can vary the frequency of it. Or we can change the phase of it. I'm not going to talk too much about phase shifting because that's a little complicated and we don't need to know it. Okay, we go on to a radio telegraph. The very, very simple is what we do is basically we turn, it's kind of a misnomer because you refer to a CW or continuous wave, well, it's actually an interrupted wave is what it is. So we have you know, dots and dashes as in our term, it's called dit and da because it's more like what it actually sounds like. So we give it a very short burst, we call it a dit, and we give it a, a longer burst, actually the timing is it does three times the length of a dit. So we either go short or long dashes in a given sequence called the Morse code. We can, we can generate, we can send any alphanumeric character from one point to another. And just, just as an introduction, here's our audio signal. And we can either amplitude modulate, so in other words, we can change the amplitude of the signal, or we can vary the frequency of it. Alright, so, for 
amplitude modulation, we're going to take our high frequency carrier, we're going to mix it, is the term we're going to use, with our modulating or audio signal, and the result is going to come out, we're going to have a modulated signal. As you see, the amplitude modu is modulated and follows, follows our, uh, our AM or modulating signal, as we call it. You see this clear enough? Anyway, this is uh, showing us uh, showing us a, a 50 percent. Well, let's do it this way first. 100 percent modulation modulated signal. So if our carrier had, if we just a straight carrier had an amplitude of plus and minus one, it would be there. But by 100 percent modulate means we we double the signal at the peaks and we drive it to zero at the dips. So that's, that's referred to as 100% modulation. We drive it right, right to zero at the dips, and we drive it to double the signal at our, at our peaks. In this case, just an example of 50% modulation. We, our peaks are 50% higher than our carrier, and our troughs are 50% lower than the carrier. But we don't drive it to zero in this case. Here's a case that you don't want to deal with. This is an example of 100%, oh, sorry, 150% modulation. As you can see here, we actually drive it below zero in both cases. What that is is distortion. You do not want that. Sound terrible and just cause all kinds of problems. All right. I'm not going too fast. All right. When we when we take and mix our carrier wave and our audio signal, when we put we put these two signals into a mixer, you put the high frequency and you put the lower frequency. Out of the mixer, you get four signals. You get the two original signals, which would be like the audio signal, the carrier signal, the sum of them and you get the difference between the two. So one subtracted from the other. So for just this example here, say we have a, uh, this is 10,000 kilohertz or 10 megahertz carrier wave, and we're modulating with one kilohertz signal or 0 0.001 megahertz. So what's the, the result here is we have our carrier that at one kilohertz above it, we have called an upper side band, and one kilohertz below it, we have we call the lower side band. And this is actually what you'd see if we're looking at a spectrum analyzer. So anyway, the process called mixing is where we put the two signals in and get the four out. Hopefully you, uh, you guys remember a little bit from uh, capacitors and inductors about tuned circuits. We're, uh, use them as a filter, you, where the frequency of resonance is, is where the uh, capacitive reactance meets the inductive reactance. You use that a lot once you get into transmitters and receivers. We won't talk about it too much. But. Well, like I showed you before, that was an ideal situation where you just a simple 1,000 hertz signal modulating a carrier. Well, that's not very likely. Because in your, typically in a voice signal, it's going to be all over the place. Your frequency of your voice changes the pitch as you different words. Your intensity goes up and down. So that's more likely what we, you would look at on a scope or something. Your actual modulated signal is going to look at. And I'm going to try and pick out and highlight because what I did, if we have time later, I'll go through. I went through the question bank because, like I said, every question is already predetermined in the database. So I went through and I just picked out some of the questions just to make sure that we, we cover the material. Here's one I should make note of, if nothing else. It says, the power delivered to the antenna is called the peak envelope power. It is defined as the average power supplied to the antenna transmission line during one RF cycle at the crest of the modulation interval. This is what you call the modulation envelope. 
In other words, uh, just like as an envelope would contain a letter, the envelope contains our, our signal. And when we talk about one RF cycle, it'd be like for one sine wave. Another one just to make mental note of, because this question is in the question bank. If a signal is overmodulated, it can result in severe distortion and the appearance of spurious frequencies, which can cause interference to stations operating on adjacent frequencies. That's we talk about the interference factor. So make note of that point, because I'm sure there's a couple of questions on it that can pop up. You need a website. Why not? talk about the spectrum, we're talking on a, on a frequency scale, of how, actually how much of our frequency band we, u, we use. So back to our, our AM signal, we looked at our spectrum analysis. So basically, like I said, we have the carrier, and we have our two side bands. So the side band, width of the side band is determined by the minimum and maximum <coughs> modulation frequencies. For our purposes, for audio frequencies for voice, generally it's from 300 to 3,000 cycles. So that's why you see a little bit of a gap here. You don't actually go down to like 10 cycles because nobody has a voice that low. So like we're showing, so in this case we're showing from what? Three, three, sorry, 300 to 3,000 cycles. And again, the same here, about 300 to, to 3,000. So in this case, we would say, okay, I'm taking up, if I look from, from here, it's basically three kilohertz, and from here, we're taking up three kilohertz. So all told, our signal that we're generating here, this AM signal, is taking up six kilohertz of bandwidth. So we're, we're actually occupying six kilohertz of space. So, just an example here. So in a condition, if we have a 100% modulated signal with a 100 watt carrier, so this carrier basically is 100 watts of power, each sideband would be 25 watts in it. So total signal we're actually putting out, for example, would be 150 watts. So, so now we think, so really, the carrier, like I said before, has no intelligence. So the carrier has got nothing in it. So basically, it's 100 watts of nothing. It's there. It's using up power Let's to send it out, but it's not doing anything for us. So well, I'm saying, if we could suppress that carrier, not transmit it, we can produce and just keep the two sidebands. That's what they call double sideband suppressed carrier, or DSSC, DSB for short, is just, just sending out just the two sidebands without the carrier. So by doing that, we can take our available power and put it into both those sidebands instead of wasting it on a carrier. But, like you say, both of our sidebands have the exact same information. They're just a mirror image of each other. They both have the exact same audio signal, just there's two of them. So what happens, so what happens if we can say, well, we only need one sideband to uh, transmit our information. Plus, yeah, amateur radio, one of the, it's a valuable commodity spectrum. We only have so much space in our radio spectrum. So by getting rid of one sideband, we only take up half the space now. So we can transmit our whole signal in three kilohertz of space. But the nice thing about that is we can take all our available power use our power amplifier, all the power we have, we can put in that single sideband. So that's the most common, one of the most common forms used now in amateur radio for, for, for HF and stuff. Is single, well, the, the, the real technical name is single sideband suppressed carrier, or more, as we all know it, by single sideband. Got everybody so far? I mean, anybody? Questions or may drag me, stop me if we're getting behind. I'm kind of maybe going quickly. But really, I'm, I'm just covering the highlights of really what you need to know, just the basics of what goes on in the radio block diagram level. 
That's all they're asking you to know, really. And maybe just another more graphical. So we took our, our baseband signal, we modulated, so we can't we actually generated an AM signal, and we ended up filtering we by process of getting of suppressing the carrier and filtering out one sideband, we ended up we can either have the upper sideband or the lower sideband. Either one has the same information, like I said. Just as an aside, typically uh, it's a uh, I guess de facto standard typically, you know, on the HF bands, was everything below 10 megahertz? As a rule of thumb, uses lower sideband. Everything above 10 megahertz generally uses the upper sideband. That's just uh, just kind of a de facto standard that's developed over time. It's nothing written in stone. All right. Now we look at the other kind. Well, I said the one other parameter we could change is we can actually change the frequency of, of our carrier. So as we hear, so we actually vary it up and down from its rest point a little wee bit. The, one of the big advantages of frequency modulation over at amplitude modulation, say, well, noise is also amplitude modulation, you know. You get the atmospheric noise, electrical noise, it, it's all amplitude modulated. So in cases where you've got a lot of noise, your radio can't really tell the difference because the signals basically look the same. So in other words, you get, especially on a weak signal, you get, you get noise and static. Well, frequency modulation is generally you don't really care about the amplitude so much because all you're looking for is a shift in frequency. So if there's a bit of noise on that, so what? We, we uh, will actually limit that out. We'll explain that when we get into receivers on Thursday. So we take our audio frequency and we will shift, and we'll shift our carrier frequency by a certain amount. But the actual amount that we shift the carrier frequency is determined by the amplitude of our modulating signal and the rate at which we change back and forth is actually determined by the modulation frequency. So for example, for our, for our FM and, and uh, amateur radio for our communications on two meters for we basically look at a maximum of a five kilohertz deviation above or below, or below the carrier. So that's determined by the amplitude of the modulating signal. So the, the stronger, the higher the signal or the bigger the signal will, it, will make it deviate more. But it's actually the frequency of this modulation determines how fast it switches back and forth between those two frequencies. All right, we talk about frequency modulation and phase modulation. It's really, for our purpose, is two different ways of achieving the same result. The receiver doesn't care and really can't tell the difference. It's just mathematically, you just achieve the same thing by two different principles. So we'll just treat them as if they're the same thing. Like I said, so if an audio signal of 1,000 hertz modulates a carrier, the carrier frequency increases and decreases by some value a thousand times a second. In other words, at the modulating frequency. The amount that the signal is raised and lowered from its rest position is called the deviation. It's like if you're on a trip somewhere and uh, your GPS is leading you along. Well, I want to stop for a coffee. Well, your GPS says, hey, you've deviated from the route. You know, here again, we've deviated from our carrier frequency. Another one to make mental note of for the game. If an FM signal is over deviated, the signal will sound extra loud, distorted, may sound broken up, and more importantly, will splatter onto adjacent channels. So you're interfering with somebody else. Not a good thing. 
questions, comments so far? Doing okay? Good. Okay. Amateur radio transmitter must accomplish a few of the following points. We've got to generate a carrier at our, at our determined frequency, free of distortion without any drift. In other words, drift, you want it stable. We don't want that frequency wandering around. We want to be able to modulate the carrier according to the type of intelligence used, whether it's CW, AM, FM, single sideband, digital modes. We've got to control our power within the range allowed us under the terms of our certificate by Industry Canada. We have the provision to be keyed up for transmit, keyed down during receive. That basically, in our case, simply is press the talk. When you press the button, the transmitter powers up, transmits a signal. When you let go, it shuts down. Very, very importantly, shall not interfere with other services or other bands. As operator interface, obviously you're going to have interface, you're going to have a microphone, you're going to have volume control, you're going to have a frequency control. It's matched, well, it's not all important, matched to 50 ohms. It must be safe to operate. In other words, not likelihood of getting the shock or RF burn or something. Okay, our very first transmitter we're going to talk about tonight is a C CW or a Morse code transmitter. Well, very they, basic, we need for every unit, we need a power supply. We need an oscillator to generate our carrier frequency. Back in the, uh, I guess in the Oldest times I was just a, uh, a tuned circuit, and of course you didn't have a lot of stability then. Was it in the uh, early 1900s, the, uh, they came out and designed a crystal. We understand a crystal is basically just a, uh, a slice of quartz or whatever, cut, so that it mechanically vibrates at its resonant frequency. So in other words, when you put a little bit of voltage on it, what they call excite it, it will actually start to vibrate. If you, and we have built that into a tuned circuit, we actually produce a nice sine wave at whatever frequency you want. So, so now, nowadays, the terminology basically determines what they call a phase lock loop or a direct uh, digital synthesis. It's electronic way of doing it mostly within an IC. It, it, uh, Nice stable, nice stable signal. And we have a, a buffer slash driver stage. What we don't want to do is this: uh, the oscillator. You can say it's all depend on uh, on resonant circuits, tuned circuits. So if we provide, we start changing them. So in other words, under different load conditions, if we were trying to drive the power amplified directly off the oscillator, as soon as there are we, uh, we changed our load at all or whatever, we could, could reflect back in this and cause, cause our frequency to, to change or, or drift a little bit. Last thing one. So basically we have a, a buffer stage, which usually, two points, so to isolate the oscillator from the rest of the radio and to, to boost the signal up a bit to put into our power amplifier. So generally, this kind of radio, because if we were to key the oscillator on and off, we wouldn't have a lot of stability because it, when you first power up, it may take a little bit of time to, to settle down. We don't do that. So generally the oscillator is running and all we do is we turn on either the buffer stage and or the power amplifier we, by key, which are our, our code key, which is basically just a switch, just a set of contacts. So we hit the key we turn on our buffer our amplifier, we pass our basically our carrier signal out to the antenna as long as you hold the key down. So if you give it a short, we just give it a short one, you're going to put a short burst, which is basically a dip. You hold it three times that length or longer, you're sending a dollar dash signal. So you're just sending that, that pulsed 
signal out to the antenna. So, unfortunately, you basically have to remember these, mem memorize these blocks. We have, we should have time to. I'll go through actually some of the questions. The last, basically, what they're going to ask you on the exam is, they may say, "Well, what's what stage is between the oscillator and the amplifier?" Well, the answer is the driver buffer. That's really what it's going to come down to. Questions like that. Not how it works. It's multiple choice. It's, they're going to ask you pick some block in this block diagram. Fill in the blank. That's clear. Hey, is, the, is the buffer is it a filter or is it uh, what is it? Who's What's that? that? Is the buffer? Yeah, a filter it's, 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 a it's basically. Network, it's basically you're going to have some filtering and uh, and it's I guess it's it's more of an isolation stage to so that you're uh, a bit of amplification some filters. step further now instead of a key we're going to we'll use a microphone we're going to want to translate or translate, transmit some voice through our system now so here's a something that might uh, maybe help you with some of the questions on the test basically anytime you have anything going in or coming out of the radio is going to go through an amplifier so when we come in from the microphone we're talking uh, usually a millivolt signal. Well, we need a lot more than that. So, it comes into a ampl speech amplifier, audio amplifier, which drives it, and that's going to that's going to modulate. There, that's the H then, first of all, so we have an oscillator. Back in the uh, this term carries back to I think the crystal days, like, back some of the older original radios. They would have used a set of crystals. They'd have basically a handful of crystals for the frequencies they wanted to use. So they would, you know, kind of plug them in. And then the other option came along would be a variable frequency oscillator. So they could actually select frequencies maybe they didn't have or whatever. Well, that term is carried over even today. If you look at even a modern handheld today, you have a choice of either memory channels or VFO operation basically adjust the dial or punch in a frequency it's so that like I say that term was carried over from long ago so again the same kind of thing we take our oscillator we buffer it a bit to keep it stable we amplify it a bit and we're going to multiply it because we generally don't have operate crystals at, at really high frequencies they, they're not as stable so and we're, we're in our case, we want to run our two meter radio in the 146 megahertz region. We wouldn't do it directly with a crystal. We'll actually say quite common would be uh, we multiply the crystal frequency actually by either sometimes nine times, sometimes 12 times. So in this case, an example somewhere that it would be uh, our crystal would be I'll give an example here, but it was somewhere in the in the 12 megahertz range, and we actually multiply it 12 times, and we actually the output frequency would be 146.94, which just happens to be our repeater. It's one of that that example was the book. I can pull that up. So we're going to take our signal, we buffer it, and amplify it, and we're going to multiply it up to the frequency we want to operate on, and in the power amplifier section, we're going to take our carrier signal and we're going to also mix in our modulator signal, or our audio signal. And we're going to actually modulate that carrier and produce, produce that AM signal. Think about AM radio, it takes a lot of power because, what do you say? Because our carrier at this point is fairly strong. So in other words, we have to drive it to basically the 200% the point and drive it down to down to zero. So we've got to add and subtract 
or carrier to give us that uh, nice uh, modulated signal. So the modulator stage actually has to deliver As a perfect SSB, power. I mean, code CW was first. So, again, very simple. So now, we take our, our simple, very simple FM transmitter. Again, we take, and remember I said, everything going in or going out goes through some sort of an amplifier. So we take our microphone. Again, we're going to take it through an audio or speech amplifier. We may, we may also do a little bit of processing. We may clean it up or filter it. We're basically going to amplify the audio. We're going to take now. We're going to, we're going to take it through an audio or speech amplifier. Speech. We now we're going to put this modulating signal into it. We're going to cause that oscillator to change frequency. We're doing it at, at this level, which is actually a, a pretty low power. There's not much power in an oscillator circuit. So it, so we don't take a, doesn't take a lot of energy to actually, what they call warp the crystal or, or whatever, just to change that uh, frequency just a little bit. And we're gonna, multi, we're gonna, we're gonna multiply that uh, frequency up to whatever the frequency that we want to put out of the radio. So we oscillate it, we multiply it, but at this point, it's actually a, it's a varying frequency. The frequency is is being modulated, or that frequency is changing with the audio signal. And that's going to leave in the radio, so we're going to put it through a power amplifier and drive as much power as we need to into our antenna. Well, Peter Thrill and I kind of borrowed this diagram, but he just showed an example using a tuned circuit. Basically, you're looking at the uh, Play with harmonics a lot because remember harmonics are just simply multiples of the of the say of the signal. So this is a very simple circuit. So basically, we we take our uh, oscillator signal. We have a tuned circuit which is tuned to the second harmonic. So it's because most frequencies aren't that pure, just raw signals. So we'll use the second second harmonic. So basically, so we put in one and we get out two. So that's yeah, the frequency multiplier, in this case it's just a doubler, it just multiplies our frequency by two. Why would you use that? What's that? Why do you need the multiplier? Like I say, because we don't, especially in higher frequencies especially, we don't want, we don't actually uh, oscillate, our oscillator doesn't run at our output frequency. It'll run at some value lower, because it's a lot more stable and also, you think about it, because say if we're multiplying, the, 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 say, the, the frequency by uh, 12, well, we also, we don't have, we also, our oscillator only has to shift 112 as much, right? We only have to make that oscillator shift frequency 112th of what it actually is on the output, right? It's a lot easier to get that, that frequency just to shift a little wee bit. It takes a lot more to, the more we want to try and shift that frequency, the more it's going to take. In some cases, you just can't even do it. But, but generally, it's because of stability. You're going to find most crystals, say, in the, in the 10, 12 megahertz range, generally. And, and you just multiply them to get what you need. That's generally how you do things. The newer, the newer, oh, sorry, I'm going to hand The newer radios, I thought they got rid of the crystals. They basically got rid of it, well, the newer, the newer models. Those are the newer risk. What they call, like I said, they use what they call synthesized systems. They use either phase lock loop, or they use the latest technologies. It's called the DDS, direct disk digital syn synthesis. But you still actually use this one crystal as a reference, so it actually divides that crystal reference or multiplies that down and, and, and locks and locks your signal to it. So even in the newer ones, they wouldn't be digital yet? Like Sorry? They wouldn't be digitally controlled yet? Well, like a DDS, digital, right. it's called direct digital synthesis. It's more or less digitally generated signal, but it still has a clock crystal basically to, to, to lock to as a reference. Your electronic watches, they have to have a crystal to maintain frequency. When crystal you, need something as, you need something as an accurate reference. But like you don't need a box full of crystals. You don't have a a crystal for every frequency. Right. 
And by we can multiply or divide our frequencies as we need to to get to get what we want. And we'll actually talk about some of that a little more when we get into receivers. Okay, now our final is a little more complicated, our single sideband transmitter. We as a circuit are first the difference between it and the is what they call the balanced modulator, is where we feed in the carrier signal from our oscillator and we feed in a modulation. But because it's perfectly balanced, it doesn't generate the carrier. All we generate was the two sidebands. So once again, here's our old microphone. We have to amplify it. Now we use this balanced modulator as opposed to before. We take our, our oscillator, we mix the two of them together, and we come out with just the two sidebands. Like I said, so we decide we don't need two sidebands, so we're going to filter out one of them. We're also going to clean up the signal, but we're going to filter out one of the sidebands. So only one of the sidebands is actually going to come out of our filter. In this case, we do this again at a, at a lower frequency. So in other words, now to get us up to the frequency that we want to operate at, say, in, you know, keep talking about say our you know, 100 megahertz whatever signal, we'll take a now we'll take a variable frequency oscillator, or it's also known as the local oscillator. We're going to we're going to miss that high frequency with our signal, and that will produce a signal on the frequency we want to be on. You know what I'm saying? It kind of, they'll kind of like add together. And we'll end up generating the frequency that we, on the frequency we want to generate. And key thing about a side, single sideband trend is we need a linear power amplifier. It has to be linear because it has to try to make an exact or a very true representation of the input signal. So in other words, the the output has to look exactly like the input, except bigger. So in other words, to do that, it has to be perfectly linear. Well, that's something point to possibly. So, do, excuse me, do when, when you actually transmit now, you're not transmitting the carrier. Nope. It's, carrier, it's actually suppressed. If we look on a spec man, you would not see it. That generates something. You now we'll talk about, again. We get into that. When we do receivers. But no, we actually filtered out the actual carrier signal. All we're generating is the just that side, side band. band of it. Is that on the input or the output? Sorry? On the input, we filter out the carrier, but on the output, the carrier. No, the actual radio. This point right now, going to the antenna, all we're doing in this, in this case, single side band, all we're doing is transferring that one side band of energy. Okay. The carrier's been uh, suppressed. Or filtered out. There's no care. No, no single carrier. Just, just that one batch of sideband energy going over. So all the carrier stuff happens on the inside of the house before the antenna. Yeah, inside the radio, we actually okay. use a carrier to generate the signal, and then we filter out just what we want out of it. Okay. So we just back up one more. Yeah. So an AM transmission and an FM transmission, the carrier gets transmitted. Right or wrong? I don't know. Yes, the carrier gets transmitted in the AM radio. It's it's modified by varying yeah, the amplitude yeah, of it. Yeah. And in, in FM, FM radio, we vary the frequency. But the carrier is transmitted but too. But the carrier but is transmitted. Side. Okay, and we'll thanks. talk about that a little more <coughs> in a minute. Huh. Okay, another. Okay, somehow slipped in a, another copy of the same thing. Oh, and also, all the last few uh, few slides, I think I put a note on. Just for simplicity, they didn't show the power supply uh, in the block diagram, but you assume it's there because you absolutely have to have a power supply in the radio. But it's not part of it that you need to understand, and it's not in any of the questions, but just threw that comment in there. Now we talk about digital modulation.
So typical, okay, so the, what we're saying is the typical situation in radio, amateur radio up until recently is basically a gen, use generated is to create an analog image of the digital signal, an audio modulate transmitter with some sort of AM or FM modulation. Well, those of you around uh, long enough, remember back when we first started the internet and before we had uh, all kind of wireless and stuff, we actually had modems, you know, on the telephone line. When you first powered it up, you heard it make a whole bunch of, bunch of tones and noises. So what we're doing in, as a digital signal is we're actually like using like two different frequencies, one to represent a zero, one to, one to represent a one. So we can take any digital digital uh, waveform and basically convert it to a series of tones, you know, ones and zeros. You know, all digital signals are just some form of uh, of ones and zeros, and just for information, some of the uh, forms, radio teletype, AMTOR, packet, ESP31. Back in the days, everybody I think remember uh, teletype machines, they're you know, big old machine, they, tra they transmitted a signal over a pair of wires, and it was just burst, burst of DC, well it's actually DC pulses, caused, uh, caused it to print uh, characters, just like a typewriter. So it actually it was modified. It took actually the very very first ones were real old tele teletype machines. Instead of transmitting it over a pair of wires, the amateurs learned how to do it with a pair of radios. So instead of having a, a, a DC link or between the two points, they used a pair of radios to, tra to transmit our ones and zeros between them. That's what they actually had. You know, guys at each end of the link would have a, a teletype machine, and they type away their characters. Then as it moved on, we've different formats. We don't need to, just for information. It's more in the book if you want, but basically it's not what you need to know to get through this. And there's a couple of kind of ways we can do things. A couple of terms we'll just explain. We talk about frequency shift keying. We actually directly cause the carrier frequency to shift back and forth between two points. Some of the uh, Actually, uh, I worked on them in the, uh, in the steel plant. There was what they called carrier shift radios. They were just control functions. All they would do is cause the carrier to shift up or shift down. And that's how you got two different uh, conditions. So we can directly shift the carrier between two points. Or typically what they use, they talk about audio frequency shifting. So in other words, frequency shifting, which is known in short form as FSK, or audio frequency shift keying, we actually just modulate it with two pair of audio tones. So in, in some of our cases, we have a box like terminal node controller, which would control it. So basically we would use a pair of tones. Uh, here's one I think they used for radio teletype. It would be uh, 1070, 1240. So one's, one uh, frequency is a, one, a zero, one the other frequency is a one. So by shifting back and forth between them, we get our, uh, our data. Another popular one was 2125, 2295. And a device, they call it a TNC, a terminal node controller, basically controls our bursts of signals, takes our data waveform and converts it to a string of uh, bursts that we want to actually use to transmit or generate our, our, our uh, signal. Okay, so here's, here's our binary or digital signal and all in, in time slices. So we, if this is a amplitude uh, carrier, no, amplitude shift keying, sorry. So in other words, we just had a single one we're going to get, we're going to burst the carrier. So in other words, we go from zero to 100% or, or the one value of our carrier back to the zero value of our carrier. In this case, we have two ones, so it's double the width. 
it's a amplitude shift key. So if we directly frequency shift, as you see, our, our frequency changes back and forth with our uh, with our binary signal. And likewise, I won't talk too much about by by shifting the phase back and forth, it it it, com it, it uh, accomplishes the same thing, just a little bit harder to understand. But we can either uh, frequency or phase shift the carrier, and it comes out the same. Just for interest's sake, by we're limited to the amount of data or how fast we can put it through because if we're limited just to just to audio frequencies, we can only put so many pulses in a given amount of time within our you know our three thousand uh, cycle window of our care. So they've come up with some some neat schemes where they've actually can play with the amplitude, the frequency, and also the phasing of, of the signals and so now that you can one waveform you can get four four conditions or eight conditions. I'm just mentioning that for information purposes. Okay. So in our radio basically we have two sections to the same radio. We have a transmit section and we have a receive section. And Generally, they use the same antenna. So what we can have is a is a high power of the transmitter being being uh, put back into the receiver because you know when you're talking of say a mobile radio with 50 watts of output, and you talk about a receiver that's talking uh, less than one microvolt or one millionth of a volt sensitivity, you definitely don't want that. So you need a transmit some sort of a transmit receive switching device. So, like I said, the uh, station antenna is normally shared between the transmitter and receiver, so we must provide a, a means to keep the transmitter signal or the receiver function of the transmit receive switch. It can either be electrical or a mechanical device, like typically uh, some sort of a relay, but nowadays they can do it with various means electronically, Electronically, being it will switch, it, it will switch faster. Mechanical devices are going to have some some time lag because they are a mechanical device. And say additional functions of the switch are transmitter power. So, in other words, when you operate the switch, it actually makes sure the the transmitters either the transmitters on or the receivers on, not both at the same time. So, when the, when it when you're receiving. Make sure the transmitter's off, and when you're transmitting, you make sure the receiver's muted. So, just in a block diagram form, here's our antenna. There's some sort of a transmit receive switch. We have our transmitter and our receiver. So, in other words, the antenna can only signal go one or the other, so you don't never have the transmitter feeding back into the receiver. Here's just a picture of a, the actual coaxial relay that just actually the uh, coax cables will screw onto and it's a coil, it's a cancel device. So in that sort of uh, situation there with the coax relay, yeah. when the relay de would detect the, that you keyed up the radio, it would switch the yeah. antenna to the yes it would it would basically it would normally it would probably normal position would be on the receiver so when you key the mic which yeah, push the talk button on your microphone that signal also goes to the coil of, of the relay okay. so as soon as you're telling it to transmit it says hey pick up switch over to the transmitter cut off cut off the receiver gotcha and here's another for example, or the book there they come up with doing it electronically with with uh, two diodes and the quarter wavelength uh, sections of feed line. If you if you remember from feed lines, quarter waves is a magic number because you're saying a quarter wave of a feed line or coax. If you short one end, 
exactly one quarter of a wave away will actually appear as an open. So we use that to, to a degree here. So in other words, so if, if we're in a transmit mode, this is not actually drawn right completely, but if we put on a 12-volt uh, signal here, we actually, we, sh we actually turn on this diode. So in other words, that diode is, is conducting. So anything from this point on would basically just be shorted to ground. So if we did manage to get any, any signal leaking from the trend, it would just be shorted to ground. And likewise, we're seeing a short here. We shorted here, so one quarter of wavelength, we're, it's showing it open. So looking at the antenna, it's saying, that line's open. It's, it's like it's not there. So all our signal is going to go up the antenna, nothing's going to come back. And likewise, when we want to receive, we change our control segment, we turn off that diode, and we actually turn off this diode. So now, nothing can conduct from the transmitter because that diode sh is turned off. Typically, they use a device they call, uh, common is what they call a pin diode, P-I-N, and by using DC bias on them, that can make them either conduct or not conduct RF energy. So this is just one form, for example, of how you actually, well, for UHF, or they only at higher frequencies because too low frequency, you need a real long coax. But, but using coax and a couple of diodes, we actually can, uh, we can achieve the same result as a relay or whatever. But you, but you don't normally do that. It's done electronically in the radio, right? Yeah. You don't I said that's one way of doing it with a couple of diodes and then people. But normally they use like pin diodes and there's, or you can have uh, transistor circuits and that will but inside shut the radio, off. They, you know. they do that in the radio? Yeah. Mind you, if you had, in some cases, where you had a separate receiver and transmitter where they're two separate units, then obviously wherever your transmit receive switching device has got to be extra. Outside the radio, yeah. But usually all within the radio that's all done. We have time, time I'll actually see if I can dig up a typical schematic of a radio and we'll, we'll look at it. <coughs> all right, we'll just talk briefly about transmitter power. Rule, general rule, don't use, should never use, have to use any more power than you need to establish good communication. So if you're talking, you know, two blocks away, why, are you, why do you need 50 watts or more, you know? Five watts is probably lots. Or if you're talking in uh, HF, and if you have a good uh, contact with 25 watts, why use more? Just generally, just courteous and less likely to cause interference to anybody else. So general rule of thumb, just use as much power as you need. Hey, our friends in Industry Canada, that's one of the terms of their qualification. For a basic uh, qualification, you're allowed 250 watts. If you have the advanced, you're allowed 1,000 watts, respectively. But these values, I think they come up with that, must have been back in the uh, tube radio days, because these values actually refer to the DC power applied to the final stage of the transmitter. So that, that 250 watts is not the RF energy you're putting out to the antenna. That's measured as, as a DC function in your volts times your amps going to the power amplifier. For we take, a, a, we take a, especially an AM or an FM signal, our carrier value is going to have pretty well a constant value. It's going to have, you know, if we measured it with a watt meter or just our carrier, you're going to see some fixed value. So this could actually, the DC would actually more likely apply it. You could actually measure it and determine it. But for our single sideband radios, it's a whole different story because with a single sideband radio, unless you have some modulation, you're putting out no carrier. You're not putting out a carrier. So if there's no signal, you're putting out zero. So if you look at a single sideband radio, key the mic and say nothing, you'll actually see 
zero. Your watt meter will show nothing. It's only as you speak or you create that sideband is where you actually see some power. So now the only way we can measure that, that's where we come into that, it comes into play, the uh, peak envelope power comes into play because it talks about the peak envelope. So the maximum crest of your highest point of your signal, from that they can cal they calculate your, your power. So that is an exam question, I believe the definition of peak envelope power, I think I defined that a little while back. And to sum up, because say, okay, for uh, basic qualifications, we talk about uh, power restrictions, you're saying that uh, would express as DC current to the final stage, it's allowed 250 watts of DC, were expressed as a radio frequency output measured across the load, 560 watts of uh, peak envelope power, PEP for transmitters that produce any kind of a single sideband uh, or 190 watts of carrier power for transmit any other type so that'd be like an AM or FM radio you have you'd be limited to 190 you any comments on that or okay, any clearer or is that basically summarize it it's, cl it's clear there's actually uh I prepared a response at the department that explains this in high detail. Okay. I should bring it in. Because it is confusing. Even the inspector is not read that thing. Okay. I don't see it. And if you choose to, to uh, move on and study and write for advanced qualification someday, you're allowed uh, up to 1,000 watts of DC power into your final stages. And uh, 2250 watts of peak envelope power for sideband and up to 750 watts of carrier power for the other modes. Well, let's see. Sitting there making up all these slides, I figured I had at least two hours worth, but uh, we've gone very quickly. Let's take a coffee break. After that, we'll any questions, and then we'll go through some uh, some test questions and stuff. How's that?